So the first thing we're going to do is see how do you get a DNA test done. The first thing is you, you buy a test from a specialized company. Then they will send you a kit with a mouth swab. You take this mouth swab and you brush it against the inside of your mouth. What this will do is it will put some saliva into the swab, but more importantly, it will get some cells from the wall of your mouth into the swab. Then you mail the kit back to the company. The company will analyze your DNA sequence and then they will send you the results. Let's see what are the goals of genetic genealogy. We're going to see four main goals here. The first one is to find your biological relatives and ancestors. So let's say you have been making a traditional construction of your family tree and you've hit a brick wall. For instance, you found someone who you think may be your great-great-grandfather, but he can't quite prove it through documentation, so you're not sure. But maybe that person has a documented present-day descendant. You could compare your DNA with this other person's DNA. If the test turns out positive, you can conclude that the original individual indeed was your great-great-grandfather. We could call this the targeted approach. But there is another possible approach, is what I call the shotgun approach. The company that has made the analysis of your DNA will also have done this for many other people, all of its other customers. So then the company can uh, try to find other people who are your second cousins, third cousins, and so on. Another possible use of genetic genealogy is to find your percentages of ethnic or national background. So you may want to know your proportion of various national origins. For example, you may want to know that you're 47% Italian, 26% Irish, 2% Native American, and so on. The third possible use is to find your paternal line and maternal line historic and prehistoric ancestry groups or haplogroups. So you may want to know what is called your haplogroup, which tells you about your deepest ancestral roots. This has some similarity to the previous goal, but it's not quite the same. It's something that can only be done for a purely paternal line, so your father's 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 father, or for a purely maternal line, so your mother's 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 mother. Uh, it's a very narrow analysis, which only looks at these two very thin threads of ancestors. Uh, it would be a purely paternal line or a purely maternal line. But it reaches very deep into the past. In the end, you may find out that your remote paternal ancestor was a Celt. In which kind of Celt? Uh, or a German or a Chinese and that your remote maternal ancestor was, uh, for example, a Scandinavian, or a Jew, or a Polynesian. Well, this third uh, possible goal, I will not be covering that today. You may want to know if your DNA is linked to various genetic related diseases, like increased likelihood of diabetes, or certain types of cancer, or cardiovascular disease. I also will not be covering this today. What I'll be looking at today will be these first two goals that we saw. Okay, so let's take a look at how do you go about finding present-day biological relatives and ancestors. But before we do that, we have to look at some basic biology. You can make an analogy of a human cell with a fried egg. The yolk of the egg would be called the nucleus and the egg white would be called the cytoplasm. The nucleus contains the chromosomes, which carry almost all of your genetic material, your DNA. The cytoplasm contains some very peculiar organelles called mitochondria, which also carry some DNA. We will deal with the mitochondria later on, but for now we're going to concentrate on the nucleus. Every person has 23 pairs of chromosomes. One of those pairs consists of the sex chromosomes, called X and Y, which determine if a person is going to be a male, X, Y, or a female, X, X. The other 22 pairs are called autosomes, so your autosomal DNA comprises almost all of your DNA. 
Every chromosome is composed of DNA. This is a DNA molecule. DNA is very important from a functional standpoint. To a great extent, it determines how your body gets built and how your body functions. The DNA molecule consists of two chains that wind around each other, forming the famous DNA double helix. Each chain consists of many links and each link has a chemical compound attached to it called a base. There are four kinds of bases, C, G, A, and T. The names are not too important to you, but the initials may be something you want to remember, C, G, A, and T. The bases are represented in this graphic by the spherical pellets. And if we wanted to, we could actually color code the basis to see the sequence. Or we could just put the letters next to the basis. If we separate these two chains, take one of them and straighten it out, it would look something like this. Instead of the pellets from the previous slide, each base is represented here by one letter, C, G, A, or T, representing the sequence of bases in the DNA. For genealogical purposes, the function of DNA is not very important at all. What is important is that the amount of difference between the DNA sequences of two people tells us if their common ancestor was very recent or very far back in time. If two people have few differences in their DNA, it means that their common ancestor was very recent. But if there were a lot of differences, it means that the common ancestor was further back in time. It's necessary to decide what kind of genetic test to do. There are three main types of genetic tests. Autosomal DNA, Y-chromosomal DNA, and mitochondrial DNA. We'll look first at the autosomal DNA test. This test compares the autosomes of two individuals. That means that it tests 22 out of the 23 pairs of chromosomes. So it's really looking at the immense majority of your DNA. And that makes this a very powerful DNA test. Your autosomal DNA is the combination of tiny bits and pieces from the autosomal DNA of all your ancestors. The slide shows an individual at the bottom and that person's five previous generations. The yellow outline indicates people who share parts of their autosomal DNA with the person at the bottom. All of them do. When you compare your own autosomal DNA with that of another person, you're trying to see if you have some of those little pieces of DNA in common with each other. If you do, it means that you have some ancestors in common. If you have a lot of DNA in common, it means that your common ancestor was very recent. If you have very little DNA in common, it means that your common ancestor was more remote. This test works very well when the common ancestor is recent, like two or three generations ago, maybe up to five generations ago. But it does not work so well when the relationship is more distant. Let's take a look at this in more detail you share exactly 50% of your autosomal DNA with each of your parents. You also share, on average, 25% of your DNA with each of your grandparents. Note that, unlike for the parents, this is only an average. You could share 23% with one grandparent, 27% with another, 26% with another, and 24% with another. So, the average for the four grandparents is 25% in common. However, for each individual grandparent, the percentage will be a different value, typically. And this is the case not only with the grandparents' generation, but also in all the previous generations. You also share, on average, 12.5% with each of your great-grandparents an average of 6.2% with each of your great-great-grandparents, that's four generations back, 
and an average of 3.1% with each of your great-great-great-grandparents, that is, five generations back. If these percentages were exactly equal for each individual in each generation, then we would be able to calculate family relationships with perfect accuracy. We could say, look, with that person I have whatever, 7.1% uh, of DNA in common. Oh, so that must be uh, that the common ancestor is so many generations ago. Uh, well, that doesn't quite work so accurately. And the reason is that with the exception of the first generation, the parents, within each generation, the percentages shown above are only average values. And this reduces the accuracy of the prediction as we will see next. Let's say that I'm comparing two people, myself on the left there and someone else on the right. So each one of us has our own family tree. And let's say that we have a recent common ancestor that would be, let's say, a grandfather. Okay, so there it is. I have my maternal grandfather would be the same person as the other individuals, the one on the right, uh, his, uh, this woman's uh, paternal grandfather. So let's say that those two grandfathers are the same individual. Now on average, I should have one quarter of my DNA in common with my grandfather. Because you have from myself to the next generation is one half, the next generation is one quarter. So one quarter in common with my grandfather. The other individual will also have in common one quarter with his or her own grandfather. So how much will that other individual and myself have in common with each other? Well, to figure that out, you have to multiply one quarter by one quarter. And when we do that, we get 1 16th. So we should have 1 16th in common, which is about 6.2%. Now, when we actually do the test, we're not going to get exactly 6.2% because of the variability of the amount that we inherit from these earlier generations, like from grandparents and, and, and before, because of that, the amount that we're going to have in common is going to show up in the test as being maybe 5% or 7%, for example. Now, that's not a big problem. It's close enough. You could still tell that we have an ancestor in common and that it's at the grandfather level. No problem there. So, when the common ancestor is recent, as in this example, you can make good predictions of relationships. Now let's see what happens when the blood relationship is more distant. So here I am on the left, here's the other person on the right. And let's say that what we have in common is one uh, ancestor five generations back. So see the little green circle on the left there and the one on the right. So that's five generations back for me. And let's say that woman up there at the top of my side is the same individual as the woman on the top on the right family tree. Now with that individual, with my own ancestor from five generations ago, I should have in common one thirty-second of my DNA because it's myself and one generation back is one half, another generation is one quarter, another generation is one eighth, another generation one sixteenth, and another generation will be 132nd. So I have 132nd in common with my ancestor from five generations ago. The other individual will also have 132nd in common with his or her own ancestor from five generations ago. So if we try to figure out how much I am going to have in common with this other individual, I have to multiply 132nd by 132nd. And when we do that, we get a value of 1 1024th in common. Well, Simplifying it is one one thousandth in common, and that's one tenth of one percent. So we have very little in common, but it should be one tenth of one percent in theory. The problem is that because of the variability of how much uh, a person inherits from people several generations back, it's not the same amount from each person in that generation. Because of that, it's going to turn out that I'm not going to come out as having one-tenth of one percent in common with this other individual. It could turn out 
uh, then the result will say, oh, I have one whole percent in common with this other individual. Or it could say that I have zero in common with this other individual. So what will that do? Well, if it's one percent in common, it's going to imply that I'm going to figure that I have uh, an ancestor in common with the other individual three generations back instead of five generations back. And if the result comes out as zero, I'm going to infer that we have no relationship at all. So that would be erroneous because this ancestor was, uh, the common ancestor was five generations back. So this is the problem. The implication here is that when the common ancestor is more remote, prediction of relationships are less accurate. A separate point that needs to be brought up here is that all the calculations that I have been showing apply when the two individuals have a single person in common. If there is more than one person in common, the percentages of contributions to the common DNA need to be added. For instance, if two people have one ancestor in common five generations ago, we should expect them to have one per thousand of the DNA in common, on average. But if they also share that person's spouse, we should expect them to have, on average, two per thousand of the DNA in common. The second type of genetic test is the Y-chromosomal DNA test. Only men have a Y chromosome, and this test is used to compare the Y chromosomes of two men. The Y chromosome is passed from a man to all of his sons, practically without any changes. Therefore, I have the same Y chromosome as my father, as my father's father, as my father's father's father, and so on. The green outline in this slide indicates the people who have the same Y chromosome. The Y chromosomal DNA test is very good for testing if two men are connected through purely paternal lines. Is my Y chromosome exactly the same as the Y chromosome of my paternal ancestor from say 100 generations ago? No because the DNA of the Y chromosome does change over the generations. There will be mutations. Mutations are a random process and it goes very, very slowly. But given enough generations, you will see changes in the sequence of DNA bases. So changes in the letters of the DNA sequence. For instance, a, a T may change into an A. Now, let's say that we're comparing myself with somebody else from the audience. And let's say that uh, I and this other uh, gentleman from the audience, we have a common ancestor 100,000 years ago. That'll be a long time ago, obviously. At that point, uh, modern humans would not have left Africa yet. So it'll be some African that we have in common. So let's say that we know somehow that we have a common ancestor 100,000 years ago. Well, from the time of that ancestor, such a long time ago until me, there will have been changes in the letters. And also from that far, far away ancestor to this other individual in the audience, there also will have been a lot of changes in the letters. So my letters and the letters of this other individual in the audience will be definitely very different from each other. So let's say now that instead of having an ancestor 100,000 years ago, let's say that we have a common ancestor 5,000 years ago. So maybe it'll be some, some Celt lost somewhere in Europe. And um, if we have this ancestor in common, between this common ancestor to me, in that period of time, there will have been some changes in the letters. And from that ancestor to this other individual, there also will have been some changes in the letters, but not all that many. So if we compare our DNAs, there's going to be some difference between us myself and this person from the audience, but there will not be a whole lot of differences between us. Now, let's say that our common ancestor is still more recent. Let's say we have a common ancestor from the Middle Ages, like a thousand years ago. Well, in that amount of time, it's most likely that from that common ancestor to me, and from that common ancestor to this other individual, 
there will have been no changes in the letters. Therefore, my letters and this other person's letters will be the same, most likely, if the common ancestor is uh, relatively recent, like a thousand years ago, if you can call that recent. And that is a problem. If, we, if two people have a common ancestor over the past 1,000 years or so, the DNA sequence of letters will probably be the same because there was not enough time for a change. So let's say that you're trying to find out if you and somebody else have a common ancestor 200 years ago. That's pretty realistic for a genealogical test. So you're trying to find out if you have a common ancestor 200 years ago. If the test says that the letters are different, then you can safely conclude that you do not have a common ancestor 200 years ago. But if this test says that the letters are the same, you cannot conclude that you have that ancestor in common from 200 years ago. Maybe you don't have that ancestor in common, and what you have is a different ancestor in common from 800 years ago, or from 1200 years ago, or from 50 years ago. So the problem with this test is that it does not have enough resolution to figure out close relationships. But Mother Nature is going to come to help us out. This is the DNA sequence that I showed before when I first talked about DNA. But in the parts of the Y chromosome used for the Y chromosome DNA test, the letter sequences don't look quite like this. They come in repeated sequences. Look, for instance, at the first three letters of the sequence in this slide, CTA in green. In a real chromosome, they will be repeated, as you can see in the following animation. So the three-letter sequence was repeated five times. The same thing will happen to the next three letters, GAG. In a real chromosome, they will be repeated. So they were repeated seven times. The next trio of letters, TCC, will also be repeated. In this case, there were three repeats. And the next three letter sequence, ACT, will also be repeated. In this case, there were five repeats. These are called short tandem repeats, or STRs. The number of repeats in each STR will change over time, and it'll change much more frequently than the letters themselves. So let's say that someone in this room and I have a common ancestor 500 years ago. Our letter sequence will almost certainly be the same. CTA, GAG, TCC, and ACT. However, I may have the STR shown in the slide on the top, five repeats, seven repeats, three repeats, and five repeats, while the other person maybe will have six repeats, seven, two, and five. So five repeats compared with six, well, that's one difference. Seven repeats versus seven repeats, no difference there. Three repeats versus two repeats, that's a second difference there. And five repeats with five repeats, no difference there at all. So we would have two differences in the number of repeats in this example. And this gives us much greater resolution, which allows us to figure out approximately how far back our common ancestor was, even if it was just a few hundred years ago. So we probably need to modify the name of this test to something like STR, Y chromosomal DNA test. In an STR test, you compare the number of repeats in your own Y chromosome with the number of repeats in somebody else's Y chromosome. We know how many generations it takes, on average, to get one STR mutation. Therefore, if we know the number of STR differences between two people, we can figure out how many generations ago was their common ancestor. The STR tests don't look at the entire Y chromosome. They look at a specific set of points in the chromosome. We can call them markers. Some tests look at very few markers, as low as, as low as 12 markers. 
while other tests look at many markers, up to 500. The more points in the test, the more accurate the precision of the prediction, but also the more expensive. I did one of these Y chromosome DNA tests to figure out if some of the guy and I had a common ancestor about 200 years ago. Average mutation rates indicated that I should expect to find 2.4 STR differences between this other individual and me, if we did have the common ancestor. The result came out as two STR differences, so this confirmed that we did have the common ancestor 200 years ago. The third type of genetic test is the mitochondrial DNA test. I talked before about a fried egg making a comparison with a human cell. What we have here is a different kind of egg. It's the cell that the mother provides for the generation of a new baby. It has a nucleus with chromosomes and a cytoplasm that contains mitochondria. The mitochondria are very peculiar organelles located outside the nucleus. They are in the cytoplasm. Mitochondria have their own DNA. It's called mitochondrial DNA and is completely independent from the DNA of the chromosomes. On the left, we have a sperm cell, which will make the father's contribution to the generation of the new baby. The sperm cell does not have any cytoplasm nor mitochondria. It's basically a nucleus with chromosomes plus a tail. The sperm cell will go into the egg cell and the two nuclei will combine to produce the nucleus of the baby's first cell. The baby's first cell is called the zygote. Its nucleus has a combination of chromosomes from the father and chromosomes from the mother. But all the mitochondria are from the mother because the sperm cell did not bring along any mitochondria. From a genealogical standpoint, the mitochondria have a very important characteristic. They're transmitted without changes from a mother to all her children. Men receive mitochondria from their mother, but they do not transmit any of their own mitochondria to their children. The mitochondrial DNA is transmitted from a mother to all her children. If I am the person at the bottom of this diagram, I have the same mitochondrial DNA as my mother, my mother has the same mitochondrial DNA as her own mother, and so on. The light blue outline shows the people with whom I share the same mitochondrial DNA. My mitochondrial DNA will be different from the mitochondrial DNA of all the other people in the diagram. Mitochondrial DNA tests can be useful for figuring out if two people are connected through a purely maternal line. The mitochondrial DNA test can be seen as a female counterpart to the male Y chromosome DNA test. Instead of following the purely paternal line, it follows the purely maternal line. To summarize these tests, the autosomal DNA test compares the autosomes of two people. In effect, it compares all my ancestors with all of the other person's ancestors. The Y chromosomal DNA test compares the Y chromosomes of two men. It checks if I have a common ancestor with the other person in our purely paternal lines. The mitochondrial DNA test compares the mitochondria of two people. It can be both women or men. It checks if I have a common ancestor with the other person in our purely maternal lines. Now we will look briefly at the test that tries to find a person's ethnic or national background. The raw genetic data in this test are very accurate. The problems are in the interpretation of those data. And we're going to be seeing that there are a couple of important problems. The first problem is defining what we mean by a nationality. So what does it mean to be Irish? or German, or Spanish, this is not quite as straightforward as it seems. Spain was first populated by hominids uh, several hundred thousand years ago. Um, we don't have any, it seems that we don't have any genetic uh, contribution from those hominids. Uh, 
the first people from whom we do have contributions to our DNA are the Neanderthals. They came to Spain around 130,000 BC. Now, the Neanderthals are not considered modern humans. Those will be the Cro-Magnons that uh, replace them later on. But we do have, uh, the, the Neanderthals did mix with the Cro-Magnons, so we do have some Neanderthal DNA. I personally have 3.4% of Neanderthal DNA, and that is the case also for most of the people in Europe. So the Neanderthals are our first ancestors. They were followed by the Cro-Magnons, which came, uh, they came to Spain in around 33,000 BC. They were the people who made cave paintings in the north of Spain. Um, they're the first modern humans to get to Spain. Then we have the Basques. The Basques, uh, th we know that they were in Spain around 8,000 BC. Um, what, we, what is not very clear is where they came from. One theory says that they are the descendants from the Cro-Magnons. They just, over time, they got the name Basques, and uh, in historical times they became known as Basques, but they would be the same people as the Cro-Magnons. It's not completely clear if that's the case or not. Then we had Iberians. Iberians, it's not very clear where they came from. They arrived around 4,000 BC, possibly from North Africa. Then we have Celts. The Celts, uh, again, their origin is not totally clear. The, the most uh, accepted theory is that they came from uh, Central Europe, somewhere in Austria or Southern Germany. They came to Spain around 1,000 BC. Then came the Phoenicians. These were uh, commercial people. They came from the Eastern Mediterranean and they made some uh, colonial cities in the Mediterranean and part of the Atlantic coast of Spain. Then we had Greeks also coming in. Then the Romans invaded. The Romans took over all of Spain around 200 BC. Then Jews came to Spain uh, after the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Uh, the Jews got dispersed and uh, some of these Jews ended up in Spain roughly around the year 100 AD. Then we had the German barbarians, which uh, took over the Roman Empire. They came over uh, around 400 AD. Then we had Britons, and you may ask, Britons, what are they doing there? Well, in around 400 AD, when the uh, Roman Empire was in big trouble, uh, the Roman troops left Great Britain and they, they went back to the core of the empire. So some uh, German tribes uh, thought that would be a good idea, a good opportunity to invade Great Britain, and they did. So the Anglo-Saxons went into Great Britain and they pushed the local people, Celts, uh, they pushed them out to the corners of Great Britain. And these people uh, were called Britons, and uh, some of them went to got pushed into Cornwall in the southwest corner of uh, Great Britain. Some of them were pushed into Wales and some into Scotland. And some of them stayed in, in, in England and mixed with the Anglo-Saxons that, that had come in. But some of these Britons did not stay in England. Some of them got on boats and left the island. And they went to a peninsula in northwestern France called Armorica until then. And uh, since then, that peninsula is called Brittany in France. Uh, but some of them didn't stop there. Some of them kept traveling southward, and they reached all the way to the north coast of Spain. And this is attested by historical documentation. So they arrived in uh, Spain around 500 AD. The next invasion was by the Moors. They came over around 700 AD. Uh, the Moors are Muslim invaders from North Africa, and also they came from as far out as from Syria and uh, Arabia. Now, around the year 900, there was a discovery in the northwest of Spain of a grave, and it was uh, attributed to uh, the grave was uh, believed to be the, the grave of St. James. It's not clear how they reached this conclusion, but they believed that they had the grave of St. James. And because of this, uh, a lot of pilgrimages were established. Uh, there was a pilgrimage route coming from England, from France, from Germany, from Italy to visit the, the grave of this uh, saint. So um, this big touristic boom, really, because in a way that's what it was, it required some, uh, it, it, it was linked to some economic development. So you had to provide lodging for these people, provide food for these people. And some people moved from France to Spain 
to, uh, to work on this route of St. James. So we had French people coming in. Uh, they didn't look quite like this guy, but we did have some French people coming in roughly around the year 1100 AD. Then there were two migrations that are very recent. One is black Africans around 2000 AD. That's a very, very rough date. And the other one is Latin Americans uh, coming from uh, Latin America to Spain. So in a way, this last uh, immigration is bringing people who are Spanish mixed with uh, Native American and mixed with uh, black coming back to Spain. This is a very recent development. OK, so the question then becomes, what constitutes a Spanish person? Well, we could say uh, black Africans and Latin Americans for the purposes of genealogy, uh, for the purposes of establishing um, what does it mean to be Spanish, we could say, let's say we're not going to be considering them, considering them as classical Spanish people. Let's say we do that. It's nothing against these groups. It's just the same as if we wanted to establish what constitutes uh, a Japanese person. And somehow we put into that a whole bunch of French people. We would say, no, no, we're looking for Japanese. We're not looking for French. So let's say that we eliminate those two groups from what we consider to be Spanish. And then the French, well, they're French, right? Well, let's not consider them either. The Moors, well, they're invaders from North Africa, so we don't consider them either. Britons, they're from Great Britain. They're not Spanish. OK. German barbarians, they're German. We shouldn't consider them, right? Jews, well, they come from the other end of the Mediterranean, very far away. They're not Spanish, so we pull them out too. Romans, they're invaders. They're from Italy. They're not Spanish. Greeks, they come from Greece. Phoenicians, they come from the eastern end of the Mediterranean. They're not Spanish, therefore, we would say. Celts, well, they come from Central Europe, probably, so let's take them out. Iberians, they came a long time ago, but they were not from Spain originally, so let's pull them out. Masks and Cromagnons, well, you could say, hmm, this may be the original uh, inhabitants of Spain, modern humans, but, you know, the Neanderthals were there before them, so no, I'd say that, no, we can't have these Basques and Cromagnons. We have to pull them out, too. So we have that Spanish people are really Neanderthals. Well, there's a problem with that because I have only 3.4% of Neanderthal, so I really have contributions by a lot of the other groups. Okay, so let's bring all these groups back in again. Some time ago, an analysis was done of the family trees of a number of Spanish people going back to approximately the year 1000 AD. It was very difficult to go any further back for a significant number of them. So that is where they stopped. Then a genetic analysis of these people was done. And it was decided that for genealogical purposes, this group of people and their ancestors constituted the archetype of the Spanish person. So the people who lived in Spain around the year 1000 AD are what will be considered Spanish for genealogical purposes. And a similar process was followed for other countries. So the year 1000 was chosen as a cutoff. So overall, it seems a more or less reasonable choice, but it does have an element of arbitrariness in it. So for each nationality, what we say is, What's an Irish person? Well, an Irish person is the, 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 the people who were in Ireland in the year 1000 AD. What is a French person? A French person is the people who were in France in the year 1000 AD. So it's fairly arbitrary, but it sort of makes sense. The other problem is that often it's difficult to distinguish genetically between different nationalities. One example is the relationship between Irish and Scandinavian. Starting around 800 AD, Vikings from Denmark, Norway, and Sweden attacked many places in Europe, Ireland among them. Therefore, genes that originally existed mainly in Denmark ended up also in Ireland. So today, when we find a gene in Ireland and also in Denmark, it can be hard to assign a nationality to that gene. Is it Irish or is it Danish? A similar thing happened between Italy and Spain. The Roman Empire invaded Spain around 200 BC. 
So Italian genes moved to Spain. And later on, starting around 1300 AD, Spain conquered a large part of Italy. Also, in ancient times, Celts were present both in Spain and in Italy. So today, there's an overlap of, it, of Spanish and Italian genes, and it's hard to distinguish a Spanish gene from an Italian one. Let's look at two examples. The first one is my wife, Char. She was born in Iowa, but her father's family is completely Irish, and her mother's family is completely Danish. I have tracked her paternal lines on average back to around 1800, which is about as far as you can get in Ireland, and her maternal lines on average to the mid-1700s. Now, everybody in her paternal lines was Irish, and everybody in her maternal lines was Danish. We don't know where the trails would lead to in the year 1000 AD, but our best guess should be that Shar is about 50% Danish and 50% Irish. Let's see what Ancestry.com says. So, we will ignore the low confidence, the so-called low confidence regions. We'll see that we have enough problems with the so-called high confidence regions. So, take the low confidence regions and knock them out. Now, if you are primarily European and you have, let's say, 2% of Japanese, I think that really means something because the Japanese uh, genes will be very distinct from the European ones. It will be like having uh, something that is all blue and one bright red speck on it. You can really see it. But if you're primarily like say French and German and English and then you have 2% of Italian, that probably doesn't mean very much because the Italian can easily be confused with some of the French. So it will be a little bit like having a, a, a blue picture and then having a slightly blue-green little speck. It doesn't mean a whole lot. Okay, so let's look at the higher confidence regions. And what we find first is that Ireland, Scotland, Wales have 67%, where we expected only 50% for sure. And then Scandinavia, which of course would include Denmark, uh, that's only 17%. Okay, so how could we interpret that? Well, remember that uh, Irish and Danish genes can be confused with each other. So I would say that that's 67% up there, really. Only 50% of that is really Irish. And the other 17% is really Danish in disguised as, uh, Danish disguised as Irish. So we take 17% from that top value of 67 and we move it down to the Scandinavian side. So we have 17 plus 17, we have 34% Danish now. Now what about that Great Britain? Well, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? Because there's an overlap there because Great Britain includes Scotland and Wales, which are in the top group. So let's think of Great Britain, that what uh, um, ancestry means by Great Britain is really England. Well, Great Britain was also invaded by Danes. So that 7% that is attributed to Great Britain could be uh, perfectly well more Danish genes. So this would explain uh, Schar's uh, ethnicity estimate. Okay, the other example would be myself. And I've tracked my own family lines on average back to the late 1600s and my ancestors were all Spanish except for an Italian four generations ago. So I am 15 sixteenths Spanish, that's 94%, and 1 sixteenth, that is 6%, Italian. So let's see what Ancestry.com says. Well again, we ignore the low confidence regions, cross them out, and we look at the high confidence regions. All right, we'll have an area called Europe South. And now Europe South, if you look at the map on the lower right there, Europe South really is, they used to be called it, uh, they used to call it uh, uh, Greco-Italian. And now they have a slightly bigger area that in, seems to include some of the Balkans. But basically, Europe South is Greco-Italian. In my case, it would correspond to Italian genes. I'm not gonna have hardly any or any of Greek. So that 39% that says it's Italian, I would say that 6% of that is truly Italian, 
But the other 33%, that's Spanish, uh, disguised as Italian. Now the next group there is Iberian Peninsula. The Iberian Peninsula is Spain plus Portugal, and those are definitely not distinguishable from each other. So Spanish and Iberian, for genealogical purposes, they are the same thing. So Iberian Peninsula, 25%. Oh, but it should be 94%. Well, let's add the 33%, that is the, the false Italian, from that 39. So the 39 turns into 6, and the other 33 come down, add it to the 25, so that's 50-something percent Spanish. All right, the next group is what? Ireland, Scotland, Wales. Well, remember, uh, the, the people in Ireland, Scotland, and Wales are Celts, and they came from Central Europe, but the Celts also went to Spain. So that could be a confusion between Irish genes and Spanish genes. Also, let's not forget those Britons that moved from uh, Great Britain to Spain in 500 AD. So these 17% of Ireland, Scotland, Wales genes, they're Iberian Peninsula, or Spanish genes, in disguise, again. Europe West. Well, that would be France and Germany, and French genes, France has uh, had uh, Celts, and Spain had Celts, so there could be also a confusion between French and Spanish genes there, so that 8% is probably all really Spanish genes. Africa North, 4%, well, that's very clear. The, the Moors invaded Spain, so part of what it means to be Spanish is really to be partly Moorish. So Spanish genes and North African genes can be confused also. So that 4% is probably part of the, uh, uh, the North African that Spanish people tend to have in them. Okay, so this is how I would interpret this. So the, the bottom line here is that you cannot just take the ethnicity estimate that ancestry gives you and just believe it and say, oh, I'm 39% Italian. No, I'm not. I'm probably 6% Italian. So take it with a grain of salt. Okay, and uh, now we're going to be looking at where do you get your genetic data from? Where do you get your DNA analysis from? And I, these are three of the main companies. Ancestry.com, FamilyTreeDNA.com, and 23andMe.com. Now, 23andMe.com is a little bit different in that their big emphasis is in looking at medical issues. So, from my point of view, my interest is in genealogical issues, finding who are my ancestors. So, I would not, I, I have not done anything, I've never ordered anything from 23andMe, but other people may have a huge interest in on that side of things. Um, for me, my main companies f to get information would be Ancestry.com and FamilyTreeDNA.com. Okay, so finally, here's some prices for these tests, and these are from July 6 of 2018. Uh, now, one thing you really have to keep in mind is that the prices get much lower around Christmas. Typically, they go down by about a third, so I would strongly advise anybody to wait until Christmas to uh, to get DNA tests done. Okay, first, autosomal DNA tests. Well, there's one by uh, Ancestry.com for $99. Again, these are without the reductions for Christmas. Uh, Ancestry for $99, Family Tree DNA for $79. In this case, um, I would kind of recommend going with the Ancestry route. And the reason is that um, and one of the things uh, these companies will do is they'll give you matches, people that look like you from the DNA point of view. So they're your potential second cousins, third cousins, and so on. And then the size of the database of the company becomes important because there's many more people that you can be compared with and therefore that you can find some unknown relatives uh, that way. So Ancestry, I'm not sure. But I think they probably have a bigger database than Family Tree DNA. So that would make me lean towards doing it with Ancestry. Now, another thing you can do is that once you've done the test with Ancestry, you can migrate your data to Family Tree DNA. And therefore, you can look at the matches you get with the database of Family Tree DNA. 
uh, it's, it's kind of confusing. At first, it would seem that, oh, it's free to do this. You just move your data from ancestry to family to DNA, and you can see all of these matches. In reality, no. If you really want to see the matches, I, I believe in the end I had to pay some money. I forget what it was, maybe $30, something like that. I forget. If you did the test in family tree DNA, vice versa, I don't think you can move those data to ancestry and try to match the people in ancestry. So my advice would be do the test in ancestry, look at your matches in ancestry, and then if you want, you can also move them to family tree DNA and check their, um, uh, with their database too. Okay, so the next kind of test is the Y chromosome test. And uh, for these, you can see I have three tests here. One is a Y37 test that involves 37 points. Another one is a Y67 test and a Y111 test with more points. And you can see how the prices get a lot steeper as you get more points. I was able to find an ancestor of mine very cleanly from 200 years ago using the Y37 test. So. I, I would lean towards saying that you should do the Y37 test. It should be sufficient for pretty much anybody. Uh, and I, I believe that if you do the Y37 test and then later you want to do the Y67 test or something higher, uh, I think that you get a certain amount of credit for having done the Y37 first. So my advice would be to go with the Y37 test. Then you have the mitochondrial DNA tests, and here we have two tests by Family Tree DNA. I have never had a mitochondrial DNA test done, so I'm not all that familiar with them. Uh, I, maybe this next Christmas, I will have uh, a mitochondrial DNA test done, but if I do it, I'm thinking I will go with the more expensive of the two, the $199 minus whatever the reduction is for Christmas. And the reason for that would be that this $199 test, it does the full sequence test. It, 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 uh, it measures, it, it, it analyzes every single uh, base in your D, in your mitochondrial DNA. Whereas the other test, the cheaper one, the mtDNA plus, the $89 one, that one only examines one smaller part of your DNA. So I would go with a more expensive one in this case. And that's all I had for you. Thank you very much.